first of all, I'm going to apologize in advance for angry cat noises and or screaming because they are very feisty right now and there's been a lot of fighting already. Um, so today we are going to talk about sewage treatment and I hope I do not provide too much detail. There's just a lot of information involved. So what is sewage treatment? Well, it's the treatment of wastewater. Um, it removes contaminants and raw sewage. Um, and in the end, it produces something called effluent, which is the wastewater that comes from sewers or municipal wastewater treatment plants. Remember, municipal means city, so these are usually going to be found in areas of higher population density. Um, and effluent can be treated or untreated. Ideally, you want treated effluent um, ending up in your local rivers, lakes, or streams because then it's not going to produce uh, contamination of the environment and all the other negative consequences we'll talk about in a moment. So wastewater can also be broken down into two different categories. Um, this is at its source that you would have to break it down. Once it's mixed together, you can't really separate it. But uh, some places are now separating out the black water waste, which is that that comes from toilets, which can contain fecal matter, feces, um, and also can contain pathogens. And if you don't remember, pathogens are disease-causing organisms. Um, and then you can separate that at the source from gray water, which is wastewater that's not likely to contain fecal contamination, meaning it's not likely to be uh, containing pathogens. So this comes from sinks, showers, washing machines, dishwashers, any place where water drains from a home or a business that does not uh, come from a toilet. And if you separate out those sources uh, in some newer buildings, what they're doing is they are uh, taking gray water and instead of sending it to a water treatment plant, First, they're using it for other purposes on site. So for example, it can be used to flush toilets or it can be used for irrigation. But that's still a newer thing and it has to be built into the building because like I said, once you mix the two types of wastewater, there's really no separating them. So how much of global sewage is actually treated? Uh, as you can see, it's mostly in um, developed countries that you will see a lot of the wastewater being treated. This uh, graph is showing you what percentage of domestic wastewater that's safely treated in each of these countries. Um, and uh, you'll note uh, that only about 52% of global sewage is treated. This could be because of um, a lack of regulations or just lack of facilities. In some places, populations have grown dramatically, especially in cities, and they just haven't built the infrastructure, the uh, plumbing systems and the sewage uh, treatment plants and such, they haven't been able to build that fast enough to keep up with uh, the demand for it. And so in those cases, you can have sewage that ends up leaking into, um, you know, uh, groundwater, it can leak into surface water, and that can cause problems. What are these problems? Well, we can break it into a few categories. The environmental effects are things we've already talked about, eutrophication, and the things associated with eutrophication, like algal blooms and dead zones. And a big thing to remember is that all of these are gonna result in lower dissolved oxygen, and that's ultimately what causes the dead zones. Then there are um, also impacts on human health. A lot of in illnesses and diseases are carried through um, fecal waste, so uh, contaminated sewage, uh, including things like infectious hepatitis, diarrhea, cholera, dysentery, all of which have um, claimed a lot of human lives over the millennia before we had uh, access to adequate sanitation. Um, and keep in mind, it doesn't have to be uh, human waste that's causing this contamination. If you have animal waste, uh, that can also cause this contamination as well. Uh, how do you tell if you have contaminated wastewater? Well, you can test for something called fecal coliform bacteria. These are bacteria that tend to live in the intestines of mammals, and they are a sign that there is fecal contamination or sewage contamination of your water. So you can test for those. And if you find them, then that means there's some sort of source of uh, either sewage or a large amount <clears throat> of feces that are contaminating your water. So where does your wastewater go? Well, if you are in a city or a highly populated area, it's probably going to go to a sewage treatment plant. 
Um, these can sometimes receive both municipal sewage, meaning the water that's draining from people's homes and businesses, <clears throat> and a mix of storm water, which is runoff from streets, which is a, a consideration that has to be made um, when you're trying to treat the water because um, runoff from streets is going to contain different things than, say, uh, what's being uh, carried away from people's homes and businesses. But if you're in the country or more isolated area far from a sewage treatment plant, you may have a septic tank, which is uh, usually one septic tank will serve one home, uh, and it will basically... Uh, allow water that's uh, wastewater from the home to settle to like a settling tank which we'll talk about later and solids will sink to the bottom and form something called sludge and then the greasy stuff that's in the wastewater will float to the top and that will form something called scum and then what you can do is take that mostly clean water um and you can distribute it to what's called a leach field, which is just a place where you let the water go through soil and the soil picks up contaminants, extra nutrients, things like that. Um, there's also things you can add to your septic tank to uh, make sure that it helps like digest the material. So like bacteria and things to help digest any extra nutrients. And unfortunately the sludge and the scum will have to be cleared out every few years. So you have to get your septic tank uh, pumped. So how's another way we measure how effective um, this, uh, this treatment of water is? Well, we can measure something called biological oxygen demand or BOD. What it is, is it's uh, going to represent how much dissolved oxygen is going to be consumed by bacteria as they break down whatever organic material is in the sample. It's uh, measured in milligrams per liter and the higher your BOD is, that means the more oxygen is going to be required to break down whatever material is in your water. And that means there's lower water quality. So you'll notice in this chart, if you have a BOD of 100 or greater, that means your water is very polluted and it, sorry, there's a C missing there, contains organic waste, which means it's probably not being cleaned properly. Um, lower biological oxygen demand means less oxygen would be removed if this water was released into uh, a nearby body of water, and so that means higher water quality. So if your BOD is less than 10, um, then, you know, it's probably been, uh, probably been treated somewhat, but the lower the number, the higher the quality of the water. Why do we care about this? Well, it's one way to judge how effective it is where you're removing wa uh, you know, waste products and organic material and things like that from water treatment uh, at water treatment plants. But it's also going to tell you if this stuff was released into a nearby waterway, how would it impact the dissolved oxygen levels? Remember, dissolved oxygen is extremely important. And if you don't have it, you can't have most aquatic life living in an area. So it's very important to note, if I release this water, is it going to be clean enough that it will not negatively impact the water weight? So <clears throat> when you have untreated sewage in Europe, it's got a, a BOD of about 600 milligrams per liter. In the US, it's about 200 milligrams per liter. That just has to do with uh, how watery or uh, how much water it tends to be uh, in our wastewater versus other things. And, and when you have efficiently treated sewage, the value should go down to less than 20 milligrams per liter. So notice that's like a tenth of the value in the U.S. and even smaller in Europe. So how do we treat most of our wastewater in the United States? Most of it goes to sewage treatment plants, and there are multiple stages to the treatment. Uh, the first level of treatment is primary, and that's physically removing stuff. Um, so a couple of things happen. You can um, physically screen out objects. It also will sit in a sedimentation tank where anything that's very large um, solid waste can come out of solution, and then you're going to send it for secondary treatment, which is biological, where you're going to have bacteria there that are going to biodegrade any organic material to make sure it's not going to use up uh, dissolved oxygen. And then 
you have an optional tertiary level of treatment where you're basically, if your water is not coming out clean enough in the secondary treatment to be released in a certain area, let's say it's a very sensitive environment or there are stricter regulations, then you can have tertiary treatment, which is just whatever treatments you need to do to raise the quality of your effluent so that way you can release it into the water. Um, and then everything is always disinfected before it's released. That's to kill pathogens before any wastewater has been released. So let's talk primary treatment. Primary treatment, like I said, is physically removing stuff. Um, there's sometimes pre-treatment, but sometimes the pre-treatment is included with the primary treatment. It's just um, the pre-treatment would be using screens, grates, um, mesh to remove large objects. And those, when they're removed, can be taken to landfills or they can be incinerated. Then you have what are called grit chambers where water flow is slowed. So that way any kind of smaller solids can start to settle out. Um, things like sand or coffee grounds or eggshells. And then you finally move to primary sedimentation tanks, which is what you see here. Um, you're going to have water coming in, wastewater, and it's going to be moving very slowly. So that way heavy solids can come out of solution. So the solids sink to the bottom, that's called sludge. And the sludge is usually scraped off the bottom of the tank and it's sent elsewhere for treatment, which we're gonna talk about. Then anything greasy, fatty that doesn't mix with water is gonna float to the top and form a scum layer at the top. That, sk that scum is released, uh, is removed by skin skimmers. So they're going to skim across the surface and catch that stuff. And um, you can also have another step where you add my favorite apes vocabulary word, which is flocculants. It's just such a weird word. I love it. But flocculants are things um, that when you add them, you can also call them coagulants. They're going to take small chunks of solids that wouldn't naturally fall out of solution, and they're going to make them clump together. And then they form these uh, these little uh, clumps called flocks, and the flocks settle down into the sludge as well. This just helps uh, speed up the process of removing solids from the uh from the wastewater so that way you don't have to let it sit in a settling tank for even longer. This step removes about 60% of the solids that were otherwise suspended in the water and about 35% of the material that would um, end up consuming or leading to the consumption of oxygen in, uh, um, in a waterway. <clears throat> Secondary treatment is going to involve bacteria and other decomposers, um, and you're going to use them to break down any organic matter that's suspended in the water into CO2 and then some inorganic sludge that will then be collected. So um, this can happen in a couple of ways. You can use activated sludge, which is when you take aerobic bacteria, they're the kind that use oxygen. Remember, aerobic means they use oxygen. Um, and they're mixed with the sludge, which is then aerated. The aeration is going to add, oops, that's not an A, it's going to add O2 so these bacteria can work faster and efficiently. Um, and then those microbes, those bacteria are going to absorb or help digest any of the uh, dissolved organics. Uh, the activated sludge will settle out and you actually can take a portion of that activated sludge, mix it with new sludge, and it will uh, contain the bacteria that are going to break stuff down. So here is, you know, these are places where you can have the secondary treatment occurring, but I really liked this image because it shows a close up. So here you see uh, the untreated waste water has bacteria and all these solids and water and then after the water passes through in this case in a membrane bioreactor a membrane that will only let water pass through you have much cleaner water the bacteria and the solids get left out or you can send this stuff to a settling tank and then um, the activated sludge will fall out of solution 
An alternate is you can use something called an oxidation pond or a lagoon or stabilization pond. These are these large shallow ponds where you let the waste sit. Algae are going to use up the nutrients. Bacteria are going to decompose this, them. This is basically eutrophication, but not in a natural waterway. So it's not going to harm aquatic organisms because you really don't have any living there. Um, so you're just doing this process um, in a more artificial way. This step removes about 85% of the solids that are suspended in the water and about 85% of the biological material as well. Uh, additionally, you can also, some places they're using constructed wetlands. These are artificial wetlands that you can use in place of secondary treatment. Um, and uh, these wetlands, the plants and the soil are going to um, help remove any organic material and pollutants as well. And then those um, wetland plants are going to absorb nutrients. So by the time you have effluent leaving, it should be low nutrient. And apologies, one of the cats is saying hello. Um, it should be low nutrient and low pollution and be... Uh, um, potentially releasable. Now, if most, in a lot of cases, primary and secondary treatment are enough. In some cases, it's necessary to do tertiary treatment. Tertiary treatment varies widely depending on what the purpose is, what you're trying to get out of the water, but you can use ecological methods like, you know, use plants or artificial wetlands um, or, you know, specific bacteria, algae, or you can use chemical processes to get rid of extra pollutants. This can also include some micro pollutants. Um, so in places where you have environmental persistent pharmaceutical pollutants, this is a fancy term for those pharmaceutical drugs we talked about that don't come out of uh, water treat. Uh, water very easily, um, and they're not taken out by conventional water treatment. These can be things like uh, endocrine disruptors and other pharmaceutical drugs. And so in some places, you have tertiary treatment uh, options that will help get rid of those from your water. Um, you also can remove nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen because these are particularly um, going to help cause algal blooms or fuel uh, plant growth. And so if you leave them in the water in certain ecosystems, that can lead to an overgrowth of algae or plants. Um, and you can treat the water in various methods. There's microfiltration, carbon adsorption, which I'll talk about in just a second. You can filter through sand, or you can store this stuff long term in man-made lagoons to help get rid of some of the nutrients if you have algae there. Um, Adsorption is when you use activated charcoal and run water through that, and um, that can be like a, a carbon filter. And when you run water through it, it's going to, the contaminants will usually stick to the activated charcoal and come out of solution. And this, if you have tertiary treatments, can remove up to 99% of impurities. And the water that comes out of this is almost like drinking water safe. And finally, before you can release water to the uh, environment, you've got to disinfect it to make sure any pathogens, any of the bacteria that you were using in secondary treatment, any of those are killed before you end up releasing this stuff. So the most common forms of this are chlorine, ozone, or UV light. Chlorine usually is, it has been traditionally uh, the, the de disinfectant of choice uh, over time just because it was very easy to acquire, easy to add. The main problem though is that it requires chemical dechlorination because chlorine is toxic to aquatic organisms so you can't just release chlorinated water into a nearby waterway. Um, you can generate ozone uh, from oxygen in the air and bubble it through to kill pathogens. It is safer than chlorine but it's more expensive. I, I don't know what she wants. I never know what she wants when she meows like that. Um, you can also use UV light, which damages the DNA of pathogens and can either kill them or prevent them from reproducing. It's safer than chlorine, but if there are particles suspended in the water, even small ones, they can block the UV light and protect pathogens. Um, however, it's used more often than ozone because ozone is, is pretty expensive. 
Uh, in some places, they're experimenting with a fourth level of treatment to remove a lot of those things that we talked about in tertiary treatment, but pharmaceuticals, household chemicals, industrial chemicals, those environmentally persistent pharmaceuticals, um, any of those, uh, a lot of them will use specialized filters. They can use activated carbon filters um, and other pro chemical processes to uh, remove these uh, contaminants. Then finally, your sludge cannot be released as is into the environment. You have to treat it first. The major goals are to reduce the volume of it, um, especially by removing water, decrease the heavy nutrient content to make sure it doesn't cause eutrophication or nutrient pollution somewhere, and to make sure <clears throat> that it doesn't contain pathogens. So um, you'll run it through a uh, with some bacteria or other decomposers to break down any organic substances. That helps to reduce the total mass. Um, then you'll also can destroy pathogens um, and you're going to uh, make it easier to dry the sludge. Um, at that step, you've made something called stabilized sludge, which is got a consistency more like rich soil and doesn't actually have the odor you might associate with you know sewage uh, then you can send some of this stuff to sludge drying beds which are going to take that sludge kind of a slurry which means it's mixed with water and spread it on an open bed of sand that will let it dry uh, this stuff can actually be digested anaerobically as well and you can use that to produce methane that methane can be used as a fuel source so some treatment plants uh, will actually use uh, produce this methane and they'll use that to power the plant so that they're pretty energy neutral. Um, you can also take that treated sludge and you can bury it in a landfill or you can use it as fertilizer. However, if it's potentially con containing toxic chemicals, then it's not going to be used on land where crops are grown for humans to eat. So that is everything you never wanted to know about what happens when you flush the toilet or wash stuff down the sink.